By way of introduction, my name is Darren Hart. I work for Intel's Open Source Technology Center on the Yocto project. My uh, primary focus is on the kernel, both in and around, uh, whether it be kernel fixes, packaging BSPs, uh, that, sort of, that sort of work. And today we're going to talk about minimizing a um, image, both the kernel as well as the root file system, and see what we can do to get those small. We'll talk about why we care about doing that, uh, briefly cover some of the concepts and the tools that I use to go about this approach. Then we'll iterate over a few stages to start moving. Yes? I am using the microphone. Can people not hear me? Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. How about now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're going to iterate over a few uh, um, a few stages that will continue to reduce the size of both the kernel and the root file system, and finally we'll provide a summary of how we've uh, how we've approached, uh, how far we've gotten, how small we've gotten. But most importantly, and this is the the purpose of this exercise, is to come up with a set of next steps. And these next steps are largely influencing what we're doing with, can people still hear me now? Okay. For next time, right? Um, and, and some of these next steps are, are what are feeding into the um, tasks for the 1.2 release of the Octo project. So our objectives, we want to reduce the raw image size. And by that, I mean how many blocks we use on disk. Um, we re reduce our static memory use, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. In addition to our dynamic memory use, we also, and during the course of this, we want to be able to reduce our minimal or, or our boot time. So why? Why do we care about this? There's a lot of reasons, and I'm not going to go into each of these in detail. But in summary, there are there are smaller systems out there, and a lot of people say, but you can't buy a DRAM less than four megs, right? Well. Uh, that may be true. There are systems on chip where you're putting uh, memory either on the same package or even on the same die, in which case you do have smaller amounts of memory. Uh, there's mass market when this, if you can save two pennies on a chip and you're selling hundreds of millions of devices, it matters and it's worth the engineer time to reduce um, your footprint. Smaller images are faster. They use less power. Um, they, they boot faster. Uh, they reduce your processing due to I.O. overhead, and uh, as a member of the um, development community pointed out, they also reduce the amount of code that you have to maintain for your project. And if you don't have that many engineers, that's also a good, that, that, that's another advantage. So some real world examples. Uh, thanks to uh, Tim Bird and Bill Mills for providing some of these on the list and everyone else who has commented. Um, we've got digital cameras where they may have um, 10 megabytes of memory, but you really do have to boot fast. No one likes waiting for their camera to boot. You've got medical devices were mentioned with 8 megs of flash and 4 megs of memory. Uh, another, another device is an array of boards that have no storage whatsoever. They're booting purely out of memory and over networking. Um, small headless systems. You might be booting off of SPI with only MMC for additional memory but, or storage, but not for your actual um, root FS or your applications. Um, and another uh, partition flash where you might be having a really small NAND um, with the larger MMC uh, separately. So those are just a brief overview of why we care. Why do we want a smaller image? So what are we trying to get to? Uh, after doing, um, so we're, we're looking at the kernel and the root FS in under four megabytes. That after doing some, some research and talking, talking up amongst folks, that seemed to be a good target. I'd like to be able to boot in under eight megabytes of memory, ideally four. Uh, I, don't ex I didn't expect to be able to get to there at this point. I want to be able to boot to a shell in two seconds. And by boot to, I mean from power on to log in. I think it's cheating to turn off networking at this point. Um, this is 2011. Everything is networked. Um, I want to avoid an initial RAM disk. And so what, what I mean by that is I'm not going to cheat and build everything as a module when I say I've built this tiny little kernel, but oh, you have to load a thousand modules to use it in an initial RAM disk. Uh, 
And, and then finally, just the, the numbers we're going to use here are from a QEMU x86. That was kind of the easiest way to iterate over this process and do some measurements. Um, if you've been to the Octo booth, you've seen a small device sitting there with some uh, boot time numbers next to it. That's a real world example of a E600 uh, Atom development board that uh, we've applied some of the techniques here to and dropped its boot time drastically. And we'll talk more about what those are as we go forward. So let's start with where we are now. Uh, our minimal image within Yocto, this is not Sato, this is a text-based minimal image, um, includes a Linux kernel. It builds with eglibc. It uses udev, and it brings you to a login prompt. The uh, kernel image is 4 megabytes. There's 35 megabytes worth of modules, which I'm just going to ignore and not count that against it because it's really building a lot of modules that clearly we don't need. Uh, um, the root file system is about 11 megabytes. The number there you see is uh, negative 107 is the delta between um, SATO and minimal. And then the, the total size on disk of a minimal image is about 15 megabytes. That does include a little bit of free space. Um, oh, actually, no, it doesn't. Never mind. About 15 megabytes. Uh, because of a, a unfortunate bug that occurred late in the process within the kernel, um, I'm booting with 32 megs of RAM. I have booted in 8 with QEMU, but I ran into an issue. So right now, QEMU is actually marked with 32 megs, but as you'll see with our actual usage, that's more of a bug in the boot up process than it is with actual usage, and I have, I'll have numbers to share about that. Um, so the boot time with the minimal image was 9.5 seconds to a login. And I will show you deltas as we go through each stage. Okay, so let's talk about what makes up the root file system in the kernel. Well, you've got your packages, which might be for boot. They might be the libraries. They might be your applications. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, we've got package configuration, so we can change the way we build them. And we've got our file system itself, and there are actually quite a bit of things that you can do to tweak a file system or select a different file system. And then there's the Linux kernel. And how we build the Linux kernel is built up of things like which, what, what are our policies, so what things do we enable that are hardware independent, um, which subsystems do we enable, which architecture are we building for, and which drivers do we build by default. Throughout these uh, iterating approaches, I, I use these as some guiding principles. So first of all, make a budget, and we talked about that. We want, to, we want our image to be four megabytes, one meg for the kernel, three megs for our root file system. That's my goal. Um, as you're looking through what to deal with, it's basically look at what, where does 90% of your space go, and then attack that. So get the, uh, the, small, the lowest hanging fruit first. And you will find that you actually get a lot of benefit by that approach, and you cannot get stuck in all the, the really hairy spaces that take a lot of time for very little benefit. Um, leverage your, your device-specific options. So we are building for embedded targets here. So we have, the, we have the, the luxury of not building everything so it works on a general purpose system. That's for distros. Right? We're not doing that. And uh, finally, this is just a matter of uh, if you're, if you're developing with Yocto, do your development in a separate layer. It's just a really good way to work, and it keeps your work separate. It also makes it easier to identify your changes. And we'll, we'll talk about more about measurement and um, isolation as we go. And then just one last point. This talk was originally going to include some software modifications to be able to um, boot faster and use less memory. As it turns out, the configuration space is so huge, and we had so much potential to uh, shrink things just out of the configuration space that I'm not going to touch that this time. There are, I'll give you some references to some really good talks about that that um, I would probably end up duplicating, um, but that'll be a follow-on exercise once we've uh, gotten to the end of this to follow up with some actual uh, um, source modifications to the packages in the kernel to help it boot fast and small. <coughs> All right, so let's talk um, storage. Um, we're dealing primarily with uh, ELF files, so we have three sections that we care about, text, data, and BSS. Text is the code itself, data is the initialized data in the code, and BSS is all of the uninitialized data. So when you see an image on the disk, you're talking about the text and the data. The BSS is un uninitialized, so I mean, your files don't have big blocks of zeros in there that get filled later. Those just get allocated as you run. Um, 
And then finally, I found that it was useful to measure my storage in blocks as opposed to bytes. Um, if you're worried about how big of a disk do you need, it doesn't really matter exactly how many bytes you use. If you go over, you can look at it in block increments because that's how the disk is measured. Um, so memory. In terms of static memory, um, we're talking about the three uh, sections in ELF, text data and BSS. But there's also dynamic memory that we have to worry about. So as the kernel boots, for example, it's going to allocate things. And that is not uh, represented by static arrays or anything like that. Um, so we've got uh, stacks, hash tables, the allocators, page cache, reservations. Um, those are all things that take up memory at runtime in the kernel. And finally, there's also some temporary memory, which we get back after we finish booting part way. We expand the kernel. We have all of the init functions. Some of that stuff gets recovered, and we get back. Oh, we'll find it's not a large portion. And finally, the tools that we use. Uh, when you're doing an exercise like this, it's important to be able to identify, quantify, and record um, any of your changes so that you can go back later and find out what things you did actually mattered. And, uh, where it makes sense to back up, where you want to do more. I wrote a few scripts for this purpose. Um, case size, dir size, and merge config. Um, case size uh, looks at all the built-in .o files in the kernel. It sorts them by size and by um, directory, basically, to give you an idea of where all of the size of your built kernel ends up going. Uh, dir size does a similar thing for the file system. And then merge config is an upstream project that I'm working on with John Stoltz of Lenaro to try and improve the way we manage configs within the Linux kernel. And I'll get more detail on that as we use it. Uh, these are available if you're interested in using them for your own projects. They're part, currently part of the experimental meta tiny layer. OK, so this is dir size. And what it does is. It looks at the root file system. I mounted the minimal images root file system, ran dir size, and filtered by 100K. Or, yeah, filtered by 100K. So I'm not showing anything under 100K. There's no symlinks, there's no directories, there's no really small files. And what I find when I look in here is, well, udev is 640K. Something pulled in GIO, glib, and gobject for a total of almost 2.5 megabytes. And then we've also got some more UDEV work here, 115K to something called V86D, and then a one megabyte um, tarball of cached file types to help improve boot time, but it's hard on our storage. And this is just by filtering by 100K and throwing away everything else, I've shown 80 point, or 81% of the storage on the file system is dedicated to these files shown here. Glib. So what pulled in glib? Bitbake has a nice dependency explorer user interface shown here. It's the command to run it. And if I go down and I find glib, and then I, I look over here in the reverse defends and find out why do I have it? Well, udev pulled it in. OK. Well, I'm building an embedded system. I don't expect the devices to change very much. I'm not particularly worried about the policies and such and the uh, applied to these devices. So um, maybe I don't need it so much. So when we do our first stage, let's take this as a goal. Let's try and reduce the size, but, w but with minimal impact on features. I don't want to make this board unusable to make it small. Um, so let's start with using dev tempfs, right? If we don't need a lot of policy applied to these things, and we don't have a desktop environment that we want to feed new file systems that just got mounted to, let's just get rid of udev. Um, I don't need a VGA display. I've got a serial port attached to this thing. And um, if I'm not going to use VGA, I don't really need to have a really high-end frame buffer, so I can drop V86D, um, which is a virtualized daemon which allows the x86 code to run, which is needed by uVisa on QEMU. Um, I, I don't know the details about it, but um, it did take up some space on our system. And I do this with my local.conf. Um, I turn the, vit, the virtual runtime dev manager, and I just turn it off. Instead of udev, um, I turn it off. And then for the uh, QEMU x86, this usually reads V86D, and we get rid of that as well. 
We also have some file system op options. By default, we build with ext3. Um, if you're okay running without a journal and booting uh, read-only, uh, you can actually save a megabyte. So when we're talking about trying to build a four megabyte image, it seems a little silly to dedicate a megabyte to the journal. And that's because ext3 requires that you use at least a thousand blocks for your journal. So we can drop a meg there. And I thought this was fair for our exercise since most of us are probably going to be using something like UBFS or JFS, JFS2. Um, so if we do those things, we've left the kernel alone now. Um, we've, dropped the si we've dropped the total on disk size by 7 megabytes. So we are now at a total of 8 megs. And um, our memory usage is basically the same. And our boot time, though, has dropped by 2.3 seconds total already. And that was just with a two-line change to your local.conf. All right, so let's look at it again. So another dir size listing. Um, you see libc is taking up about 1.5 megs. Uh, the loader has got um, about 700K. Busybox at 600K, OK. So that, that makes up 91% of our root file system there, those files listed. Let's take a closer look at the kernel. So this is a summary of the kernel. This is our first view of ksize.py. Um, so what you see at the, on the left there is, are all the built-in .os at the top level. So we've got them for drivers, drivers, networking, the kernel, the file system sound, and then it goes on down through some smaller items, which is Arch, MM, Block, Crypto, Lib, Security, IPC, Init, Firmware, and User. Um, but if we just look at things that are above about 500K, we've got a goodly number of items here that we can probably look through and improve. So let's start with those. Drivers, networking, core kernel, file systems, and sound. Um, and there's got to be more fluff in those than there is in our root file system as it stands now. So we're going to start with the kernel, because I think we have the best chance of getting the, the most out of it. So let's dive down into drivers. So we're spending 500K in networking drivers. This isn't the networking subsystem. This is the networking drivers. Um, we've got 256K of, and I'm, I'm sorry, let me back up. On the right, you see text data and BSS. Those are summed for a total over here. Now, the BSS, fortunately, is fairly small, so it skews the numbers fairly little in terms of on-disk size. But we are looking at uncompressed size. So our BZ image was 4 megabytes, um, but our uncompressed total size that these contribute to is um, 9.6 megabytes. Okay, so this is like looking at VM Linux as opposed to BZ image. So you just take that and cut it in half and gives you a rough idea of what you're going to be saving in the actual BZ image. But again, it's basically a percentages game, so it doesn't really matter. All right, so there's got to be some things that we can do to reduce our usage of these things in the kernel. Networking. So IPv4 is currently uh, 364K. And then there's a few other items that you can see there that are all related to networking. We're losing 131K plus Mac 802.11 for wireless. If I've got a board without wireless, I really don't need that in there. Um, and then in the core kernel, we've got, some, we've got some things dedicated to tracing. There's about 100K in there in time. OK. Um, file systems. We've got NFS3. I've got EXT3. There's also a good number. There's 320K just in the top level objects, so some generic file system support that we might want to look at. And finally, 200 and, uh, sorry, uh, 700K dedicated just to sound. So if we've got a device that isn't doing sound, again, lots of opportunity for, sa for savings there. All right. Now, we could go in and just run make menu config and make our own new def config for our system. The problem with that is you're not going to have an, any idea of how much you saved with each thing that you turned off unless you really do, you know, you kind of go through it slowly. And if you wanted to reproduce that for another machine, you have to do the exact same thing again. So a nicer way to handle this is with uh, kernel configuration fragments. And that's what we do here. Uh, basically, what we do is we start with an all no config. So you turn everything off for your architecture. And then you add in each config fragment. A config fragment might be, you know, config vfat equals yes, and that's it. 
Um, typically, you want to include your dependencies in there as well so that you have a fairly complete fragment. Um, that's where mergeconfig.pl comes in, or, ooh, that's .sh, sorry, I don't write things in Perl. Um, yeah, I know, mergeconfig is in shell, it is quite simple, really, it's, it's not a, it's no technical achievement. Um, so what it'll do is it will take these um, config fragments and it'll start merging them together. It allows you to make overrides, but it warns you when you do. It'll also warn you of any missing config options. So if you try to turn on net filter, but you never turned on inet, it's not gonna work and it'll warn you that your final config doesn't have that. So it's a great way to um, iterate on kernel configs and be able to generate minimal ones and do so for multiple machines without having to duplicate the entire process every time. So what are we gonna do now? This is stage one, this is our first step after minimal. Um, well, um, I got some core bits for an x86 machine. Just let's go ahead and turn on SMP. Um, we needed the, the RTC or QEMU complaints. Um, some basic policy. We always support serial ports. Um, we're gonna use dev tempfs. Uh, we, we really want a functional system, so we're gonna leave sysfs, procfs, enable. I think I have procfs in core. Um, I've still got both file systems, ext2, ext3, I'm leaving networking on, I'm leaving virtual terminals on, the frame buffer, I went, even left printk, <laughs> which um, I, I highly suggest doing, especially at the early stages in development. Um, uh, for the QEMU hardware, there are some specific things that we want to make sure that we can support so that it can boot easily uh, in your development environment. So that's the IDE, or the ATA disks, the E1000 networking driver, there's um, floppy support, USB, VGA, Intel, and the Intel sound. So what, you know, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to not lose functionality. This is everything that that board supports, and it, or at least one instance of the type of hardware that it supports. So if we compile this kernel and we rebuild it, this is our size report. Our kernel has gone from four, um, sorry, um, our kernel has gone from four megabytes to 1.8 megs. So we've saved 2.2 megs, we're using the same root file system from stage one, so that hasn't changed at all. Um, but as we can see as we try to boot up, our early boot, which again is things like your memory used by your firmware, memory used by the, decom or the, yeah, the lo loading the static kernel into memory, um, early boot uses four megabytes less than it did before because we've cut out so much of the kernel. And again, you, you were talking uncompressed kernel size here after it loads it in. So. Um, and then after we've logged in, if we just take a look at proc mem, um, mem stat, we've got, uh, we've saved 6.3 megabytes and uh, our total boot time has also been reduced by about 3.8 seconds. So we're now booting in 3.38 seconds. And we've lost basically no functionality at this point. Okay, so let's take a look, uh, let's take a look at it again. Where are we with the kernel? Um, We've still got about 1.2 megs in the in um, in the drivers. We've still got some sizes dedicated into sound and uh, about 500k in the file system. But as you can see, it's much smaller than it was before. A, a, a diff probably would have been helpful here, um, but suffice it to say, the VM Linux total there is 5.21, and it was 9.6 I think before. So we've cut out a lot of our of our kernel code. So what are we gonna do to go to stage three? 90, nearly 92% of the root file system is now composed of eglibc and busybox. And 44% of the kernel is composed of drivers, sound, and file system. So uh, we've, we've taken a whack at each of them now, so neither one probably has some really low hanging fruit. So let's go ahead and take a little bit out of each. So for the kernel, let's only do the essentials. Um, only everything, only the things that we need, for, excuse me, the only things we really need here are going to be serial console and networking. Um, so let's, we can go ahead and drop from the policy virtual terminals. I mean, a console where you can switch back and forth. I mean, those are for distros. EXT3, um, if we can boot read only, we, if we already converted our file system over to EXT2, so we don't need all the extra uh, text in EXT3. Um, we got rid of VGA already, so we don't need the frame buffer support. And then, um, what things do we not really need in QEMU? Well, I'm not going to use the floppy driver. 
Um, I don't need USB. I've already got rid of the, the VGA, so I don't need support for the Cirrus uh, VGA card in the kernel. And I'm not going to be playing sound out of this device. So I'm going to take those out. And then what about BusyBox? I already got rid of virtual terminals in the kernel, so I can go into the virtual terminals in BusyBox and I can take those out. Um, the, I, the only change I had to make here other than the config was a very small patch to, make, to force BusyBox not to try and open a terminal on non-existent virtual terminals. Um, it, it was, its default init script was um, lacking. But that's, again, a very simple change, something I should be able to submit upstream. Um, I'm going to drop all the IPv6 stuff from BusyBox because I don't have it in the kernel. And um, to do this, all we need to do is add a BusyBox BB append file to the, uh, to the meta tiny layer and uh, rebuild BusyBox. OK, next thing in the root file system. What about eglibc? So eglibc allows you to build fairly modularly, which is nice. Um, so by what, what I've done up here is to find which components of libc I want to build. So we've got the math library, the crypt library, keeping POSIX regular expressions. I think things like grep are important. Um, and then all, all the networking support, basically. Um, UTEMP there, I, I, if I remember correctly, is needed for who. And I didn't want to cut this down so far that people were losing commands that they would expect in BusyBox at this point. Um, so this allows us to minimize eg libc without losing too much functionality. OK, and then services. I went a little overboard here. We got rid of tiny login. We got rid of the mod, uh, mod utils init scripts because we're building a static kernel. We don't have modules. I don't need all the init scripts. I even dropped netbase, which I probably shouldn't have done, but that was pretty small in terms of uh, code. I can still bring up the network interface. I just have to do it manually, right? Um, but now that I've done this, what I, what I want to do is define a new type. So I've defined a core image tiny which uses a new task called task core tiny instead of task core boot. Um, or is that correct? Yeah, task core boot is what minimal uses. Um, so instead of this long list of items, um, task core tiny only depends on base files, base password, busy box, and init scripts, and that's it. All right, so if we build our new image, we've got a nice new set of numbers. We've saved uh, 1.4 megs total and our boot time is decreased by 1.2 seconds. So we're now at a 4.4 megabyte image. That's including the kernel and the root file system. And we are able to boot from shell, or uh, we're able to boot to the shell in 2.13 seconds. OK, so now what? Well, in the kernel, we've got networking, SMP, ACPI, system VIPC, few texts, and printk. Those are all pretty core things. And if you start lopping those off, you start getting a much less functional kernel. EG libc, well, we could drop networking or we could drop regular expressions. Uh, I just don't think that either one of those are a real good bet. We start losing functionality fast to, to save space. So to go below four megs at this point, without looking at sources, let's take a look at UC libc and see what it does for us. So switching to UC libc is pretty easy. I needed to ensure that I maintained the functionality for networking in it, so I've added that to um, the distro features which the UC libc builds or uses to determine which components it builds. And then I use the TC libc variable and assign it to UC libc as opposed to EG libc. And if we build like that, we save another 1.7 megabytes, but only about a second. Now, I don't think it's fair to call this equivalent functionality um, because UC libc has obviously got a number of um, places where it's lacking compared to EG libc as far as complete support goes. But if it serves your needs, this is a great way to maintain function, uh, maintain networking, maintain um, uh, regular expression support, for example, and still be able to reduce your image size. But just be warned that it is not G libc as you're using it. OK, so this is actually a pretty good, a pretty good place. We are now at uh, 2.7 megabytes, which is well below the 4 megabyte target that I had started off with. Um, and I'm very happy to say that we're really close to that 4 megabyte target, even with eglibc. You could go further if you really wanted to. 
Um, we can drop networking support, both from the kernel and the C library. We could cripple BusyBox, get rid of grep networking tools, etc. Um, we could cripple the kernel, get rid of ACPI, get rid of SMP, IPC, few Texas, printk. I mean, who uses semaphores nowadays anyway? Um, so we, we could do things like that, and we could get all the way down to a 1.6 megabyte root image. That's a 600K kernel and a 1.1 megabyte root FS. I booted this. It works. Um, it's as small as it was in the good old days and just about as functional. <laughs> so, um, so here's a summary of, of, of what we've done. Um, stage five is stupid small over here. Um, the other thing I've done is I've, I, I dropped Sato from the list. It's on the um, second floor, I think, right over there. But it's not really, right, it's not, the, it's not our target image for the minimal size. But I did want this to be visible, so that's why I, I left it out. Um, so we went from almost 16 megabytes, and I'm going to say stage four here is the thing that's relevant, um, is about, what I say, 2.7, uh, I think, 2.7 megabytes. And even if we keep eglibc, we're at just over four. Um, but we made a huge improvement here just by modifying our kernel. Right? We got rid of all the stuff that we didn't need in our kernel. So obviously, this sort of, um, I, I think this goes along with the don't sweat the small stuff theory. Right? Start at your 90% and you start getting a lot of benefit in a hurry and it slows off from there. So you gotta decide how much investment am I willing to put into it? At what point do I just say, okay, it's worth it because it's more and more work and you lose more and more functionality um, as you go down. Memory usage. So this is similar. I dropped off stupid small because it's hard to determine how much memory you're using without proc and without print K. Um, so it's probably here-ish <laughs> if I had to guess. Um, so we started off at needing about 16 megabytes to boot originally. And down here, we're using just under six megs, uh, just over six megs here. So I didn't make my target uh, of four, um, definitely, but we definitely made our target of eight. And um, if you'll trust me on the, the uh, QEMU needing 32 megs as being a bug, most likely in our uh, parsing of the ACPI tables, and uh, last time it was associated with DMA, DMA when it failed. Um, so I just have to go back look into why, why that's happening and uh, it's most likely fixed upstream and I'll just have to backport it from uh, the, git, the Linus's git tree. That's what happened last time. And, let's see. and our boot time summary. Very similar slope to what you've seen before. The, the blue line is the kernel um, and then the, the red line is login. So to measure kernel time, we turn on print k time at boot time, and um, uh, the the point that I measured was at freeing kernel memory. Right? That that was the nice the last point in the D message log that was common amongst all the kernels. So that's what we used there. Um, unfortunately, the login was a little more a little a little more rough. I do three or four times on the stopwatch, but at six plus seconds, it's still something where the the error is small enough to be mostly within the noise. So. A better approach would be a couple of GPIO pins and an O-scope, but I, I didn't, or rather a, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, so I think that demonstrates our boot time. We started off at just under 10 seconds, and we're, we're wrapping up at um, uh, about 1.2 in the, in the stupid small space, space here, but um, just over two seconds. So we're right at about our goal, at least on QEMU. It's a slightly different story in hardware. Um, and we can talk about that in a bit. But I wanted first to share next steps. So what did this do for us? What did this, what did this exercise, uh, what was the outcome of this exercise? Um, I did all this work in a layer called MetaTiny, and there's links on the slides which you can uh, grab from the Linux Foundation site that'll have the, the MetaTiny layer. This is not a, a production layer. Please don't grab MetaTiny and try and use it in a, in a product. Um, what MetaTiny was there for is a experimental layer that to experiment with tweaking the configs and seeing what we can do without mucking with the original sources and, and, and breaking things that way. Um, so what do I need to do next? I think I should restore NetBase because it, it's just handy and pretty small. 
I think we should split up UDEV packaging so that we can separate UDEV from the, the GLib component. If, if, you don't, if you're not talking to the desktop, you don't typically need GLib or GObject, at least that's my initial understanding. Um, and I think, um, if, if I remember correctly, I think OE actually has a split out uh, of UDEV, which we can probably leverage. So I think that'll, that won't be very difficult. Um, as I was working with the kernel, I found that by default in the kernel, what we would do is we would specify these config fragments, and then as we build out, we'd build out with a def config, meaning we'd accept the default. When you're building a tiny image, you don't want that because you start pulling in things that you never specified, but you still get them, and they add a bunch of size to your kernel. So being able to say, here are my config fragments, and oh, by the way, use all no config instead of def. So while the kernel has got config fragment support in the Linux Yocto recipe, B BusyBox does not. And in order to modify BusyBox, I had to write my own layer, and I had to create a BB append file. I think this is a, a much more difficult, and, and then create my own def config and save it in the files associated with the recipe. Um, I, I think we can do a better job at exposing these configuration tunables to the user. So what I'd like to be able to do is introduce a similar sort of config fragment management that we use in the kernel in the BusyBox recipe. Hopefully this is something we can contribute upstream. I haven't spoken with the BusyBox folks to see how interested they are in such a feature. Um, and then what we'd like to do is once we have that, well, if you've already told and if you already said in your distro features that you want IPv4 networking, it's kind of annoying to have to go into your BSP and the Linux Yocto kernel and say, yeah, yeah, I really want uh, INET and IPv4. And go into BusyBox and say, no, no, I, I really want I, you know, I really want IPv4 uh, support. I need IF config. I need. If you've already said it. Um, it'd be really great if it just sort of propagated, and and everything that could use networking knew that. So we want some sort of a distribution package feature mechanism, of which there is one, but it needs to be somehow augmented to um, dynamically configure some of the other other recipes. I'd say one of the challenges here, though, is to not do something that's so implicit or indirect that you've told it, no, I don't want IPv4 networking in BusyBox, but you get it anyway because the distro is in. You've got to go hunt it down and find out why. So we need to make sure that it's, it's something that doesn't introduce silent errors um, that make it difficult for people to use. That's one of the challenges with that. Um, and then. Rather than just doing a meta tiny layer, which modifies an existing uh, distro definition, um, in talking with folks, I think the preferred approach here would be to define a something like a Pocky tiny distribution as opposed to just Pocky. And in here, we can define these various images. Um, one one thing that's that's of interest, though, is as, as you saw, as we went, there were so many configuration options. One tiny config is probably not going to be adequate. So we need something like, do we have a, you know, we've got tiny, we've got tiny no network, maybe do we need tiny graphics? Because everything I did was without graphics. Do we want to build with direct FB and have some sort of um, minimal thing there? Obviously the kernel hardware support is slightly different because we can do that with our BSPs. As you, know, as you define your BSPs, you can say um, which, what hardware you want to enable. And then uh, in, in extension to that, we need to be able to add the kernel configs to the BSPs that do ship with the Yocto project. So these are the to-dos that have come out of this exercise. And um, there's some links here to be able to, uh, if you haven't got something with the Yocto project website on it, raise your hand. Right, okay. Um, and then there's um, the meta tiny layer is here. And you can go check that out if you just want to see kind of how those configs work and how you extend these recipes, how you define the, the layer config to take advantage of some of this stuff. Um, and for people that would like to go even further and understand what can I do to modify my, the actual sources that I use, and there's a really great talk um, given at ELCE last year by Andrew Murray, which um, I found the hour watching the video to be very worthwhile. I'd encourage everybody to do the same. Uh, it's pretty easy to find uh, the ELCE 2010 videos and just uh, scroll down, search for Minimal or Andrew Murray. Uh, excellent video. Um, for some of the context, context regarding uh, memory usage within the kernel, I used some of Andy Clean's uh, slightly dated but still very valid uh, papers, I believe, from 2006 uh, regarding memory waste within the kernel. This is another step that we can probably spend some time in when we want to start modifying source in a way that can be maintained upstream. 
I know Tim Bird has been, uh, is Tim here? Um, okay, okay, good. No, um, I, know, uh, I know that he's been trying to get some more work done with Linux Tiny. Um, so that's a great way to be getting some more of the, some more configuration options within the kernel. The nice thing about doing it that way is you don't have to maintain these outside of the kernel and try and keep up with kernel development and maintain all of these configurations um, over time because that, that gets to be a real hassle. Any changes you make to your sources, I, I feel pretty strongly you want to get those upstream or you're just going to be maintaining those things for a long time and that can be a lot, a lot of effort. Um, also a call out to Phil Blundell's, uh, Blundell's uh, meta, meta micro layer, which basically does a lot of what I just talked about here, but he does so in a, in a, in a nice way with distro distributions. Something that he didn't do was work on a way to modularize the, the, the kernel config. And that's one of the, one of the advantages. He didn't have the Linux Yocto recipe to work with, which already has the config fragment support. So that was one of the things that uh, we did here that was sort of a, uh, in addition to that. But it's also worth taking a look at if you're interested. Um, and that's what I have. So I hope that wasn't too terribly fast. We went through 48 slides. Um, that's basically a slide a minute, um, which is a third of the rate at which Stephen Rostat gives his talks. So I don't know if anyone's presented with Stephen. So does anyone have any questions? We've got um, about four minutes. So any, any questions? Yes? Otherwise, I'll just be repeating anyway. Do you have an approximate value of the from scratch build time for one of those uh, relatively small images? For one of the? The from scratch build time. Like, I download Yocto, I want to build one of those images. How long does it take? Oh, a build time. Yeah. Ah. I really, I really don't have a good answer for you. And, and, and let, me, um, let me tell you the reason. Um, I built the minimal image. And then I changed the kernel. And then I rebuilt, but I only rebuilt the kernel. So throughout each stage, I, I only had to rebuild a small portion by, and because by default the Octo project will, or BitBake more specifically, will reuse the, part that's, the parts that you've already built. Um, so by the time I was building the smallest one, right, it was a matter of a couple of minutes. So, and it, of course, depends greatly on the type of hardware that you're building on. Anybody else? Put everybody to sleep. But, but typically, I, you can, if you've got all the sources already downloaded, it usually takes about an hour to build minimal, I think. That's, for me, that's... That's a reasonable number f without going crazy in hardware. Yeah. And, and so this would be considerably smaller. The, the, the kernel recipe um, spends a great deal of time. Uh, it does some things that are very convenient for deployment, such as making every module a separate package. Um, so that you don't have to install all 35 megabytes of modules. But the cost there is, of course, you have to run RPM on every single module, right? So there's an initial cost, but it, it, there is some real added benefit for that time. But we save all of that time by not building any modules. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that hour is, yeah. It's, 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 it's completely building all the cross tool chains, everything, you know, so it's not just building Linux, it's building all the tools and the li libraries and bootstrapping the whole thing. Anybody else? Yes, Dave, would you hand the microphone back? I think it's been a while since I built a uh, uh, root FS, but uh, we used squash FS. Um, so why wouldn't you consider using something like that? You save a lot of space and it also doesn't decompress completely, it's all paged com de decompression. So. I spent a little bit of time looking at SquashFS. I think it, um, if I remember correctly, um, it, it depends a lot on the hardware that you're using as to whether or not that's a good approach. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's certainly an option. As I said, there are other file systems that you're going to use. Um, it probably would have been a good idea for me to write down the benefits of the various file systems that are, are that are currently available. Um, is SquashFS read only? Yes. Okay. So I think if you're, I think that may have been one of the reasons that I had overlooked it because there are some better options now that um, are read write for for flash file systems. For our purposes, we always come up read only and then we switch root after that. Okay. And then you switch yeah. to a regular file system. 
it may be a perfectly good way to go in, th in that case. So th that's the point of the file system slide was not to suggest that everybody use ext2 and read only. It was to say, explore your file system options, pick the right one for your hardware. SquashFS may very well be it. Okay. If there are no more questions, um, I really appreciate everyone at attending. I, I hope there everyone got something of value out of the presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to send us a mail, drop by the booth. We'll be around. Thank you.